Welcome back everyone to the review of the Luxman LV103. Now I've um it's been a while since I've done the restoration video that you saw with this uh, amplifier and I've been spending some time with it just bedding it in getting to to know it a little bit I've been putting it into service with my uh my larger amplifiers, um, just sort of mixing things up a little bit, trying to get an idea of, you know, what I think of it. So anyway, I thought we would do this review a bit different. I mean, I'm gonna talk about the sound at the end, but I thought we'd have a look at the design of it. Cause you know, I've been through this whole unit. I wanna show you, you know, um, what's great about it, what's not great about it and what things you need to fix on these units if you happen to come across one of these amplifiers in the wild and you want to get it up and running. Um, so anyway, look, I'll get the lid off. Let's get started. We'll start talking. Okay, so you, you would have seen my time-lapse video. You know the amount of work that went into this unit, you know. All the capacitors are top shelf, Elmer Silmax, Nichicon Muse, some films, um, everything else like Panasonic, whatever. There, there's no crap in this amplifier. It's as good as I could get it for the parts that are available at the time. Now, you know, I've stripped this thing. All the MOSFETs have been redone. Well, they're, they're still original MOSFETs, but all the thermal compounds been redone. The frame has been gutted. Everything's been resold and all the corrosive glue is gone. Uh, you know, this is about, well, this is beyond what you would pay someone to do. This is a passion project. This is not <laughs> something you do to flip it and make money because there is no money to be made in the amount of hours of labor that go into restoring one of these things to this level. So when I talk about the sound of this thing and what, you know, what I think of it, it's pretty much as good as you can get it. There are some improvements that we'll talk about, but that's gonna require excessive amounts of screwing around that is beyond basically what anyone would be willing to do except to drive themselves insane. <laughs> so just keep that in mind, you know, it's this is a probably best case scenario at this point, unless there's something that I'm not aware of in these units, but I've done a lot of research that can be done to improve them, but we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, so what do I love about this unit? Well, I love the fact that it has tubes, obviously, and I love the fact that they're on the front. But I also love the fact that you have tubes in the amplification circuit, but also MOSFETs driving the output. So this is sort of the best of all worlds um, crazy circuit design for whatever reason it was done at the time. Uh, but MOSFETs are considered, you know, these days to be the best thing next to tubes if you want the tube sound. Now, you know, with by having MOSFETs in the output stage, you don't require any output transformers. It means the unit runs a lot cooler. Uh, it's a lot more efficient. There's a lot of things that are considered good benefits in the in the way this thing is designed and it's sort of like the best of all these technologies you know your pnp npn transistors your fets mosfets tubes this thing has got everything in it and that alone makes this a cool collector's piece to to have in your collection now this is also probably one of the last things that luxman did before Alpine bought them out and things just went downhill. And that's not to say this thing is top shelf. I mean, it is, look, I, maybe I shouldn't say that. It is top shelf, I think, for the era, but it is not like 70s brick shithouse quality. Like it's, it's definitely, you know, had corners cut to save money. This is the start of the end of the audio era when things started to go downhill. Okay, so yeah, you know, I love the design uh, and you know, it's just such a cool piece of history. Now, 
what else can I say about it? So let's go on to the problems that this thing has, of which there are many. So we have the speaker protection relay here. We also have the header that runs all the speakers and the switching and blah, blah, blah. Now, this relay ha will get bad contacts in it. The, the, the switching pads will get carbon build up and they'll start arcing. So this relay needs to be taken apart and the contacts cleaned, deox it, whatever, or you replace the relay. I just cleaned it up and it seems to be fine. And you've also got the, the connector here. Now, why do I specifically bring this area up? Well, if you look here, I've reflowed all the joints here and I've seen this on two units now where these connectors will dry joint and so will the relay contacts. Like this whole area, for some reason, likes to get dry joints. And I'm not exactly sure why, because it, I mean, it is a bit black here, but there's not a lot of heating in this area. Just keep that in mind though. I What I was getting in regards to this was distortion and crackling. And the best way to know if that's what you're dealing with, is just, just get a screwdriver and just um, sort of tap on that area. And if you start hearing increased uh, crackling or whatever, then you've got a problem. But honestly, just do it. Just reflow this whole area and uh, make sure it's all up to spec because that's gonna cause a lot of audio problems. Now we have film caps on the power rails. Uh, so 4.7 film bypass caps here, one UF on here. They have been checked for the foil side and put to ground. So they are correct where they're supposed to be. Um, I believe that's the main supply rail for the amplifier and I think that's for the tube section, if I remember correctly. Okay, we good with that? I hope we're good with that. Now, uh, corrosive glue. You would have seen the video, I spent a lot of time scraping all that off. For anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's basically a glue that holds capacitors in place or other components. Now in that this era, that glue would either become conductive or corrosive and start to eat through metal contacts. This one wasn't too bad, it was starting to do some of that. Uh, so I also, after cleaning the glue up and changing the components, I replaced all these metal jumpers as well because they were starting to get black. That was more of an aesthetic thing. They weren't destroyed, but they weren't great either. Keep that in mind. Now, the EQ amp board uh, is definitely one of the things you really need to get into if you want this thing to be happy for a long time. Um, there were some capacitors in this section that were bad and they all sort of were around this area down here. Now, there are two regulators down there that you would have seen in my time lapse that I put heat sinks on. They put out an insane amount of heat and they have no cooling really. Um, so they need to be taken apart uh, redone heat sinks on them and make sure they don't touch each other and make sure they clear of everything. And I, I know it's really hard to show video in this area or whatever, but there's some capacitors that I've tipped on their side and whatnot to try and keep everything clear of that area because the heat is just, even with these heat sinks on it, it's insane. So just keep that in mind that you know, for longevity, I want this unit to last another 40 years. So you do not want those regulators to fail because they are not available anymore. And uh, yeah, it's just, you don't want to go there. This has definitely had them replaced already because the leads here were not great. And I had to sort of recover what was left of them, unfortunately. So one is lower than the other. It's what I've got. I can't, you know, there, you can find some new old stock of these things, but beyond that, you can't get them anymore. So 
keep that in mind. Now, next issue is the tube section, which maybe we should have just talked about first. But, you know, you, you're refreshing this whole unit. You probably want to put new tubes in it. So what are your options? Well, the stock tubes, I believe, are General Electric, USA, 6FQ7s. Uh, they work fine, but, you know, you've got this thing apart. You probably want to put something new in there, and the faceplate is not easy to remove. So... I ended up going for Electra Harmonics tubes. I don't want to get into a debate about what tube sound or whatever, because honestly, I can't hear a difference between them. But the important thing to remember, if you use Electra Harmonics tubes, is they will not fit in the holder. They are thicker. They are chunky boys. Uh, they don't look that different, but you can see very clearly... <laughs> They are not going in there, okay? So you will need to modify the tube holder and widen the, um, you know, the gaps if you want to fit it in. You also need to do it for the face plate as well because it has the same thing as like a little cosmetic uh, cover in there. So yeah, keep that in mind. Now, design of the amplifier. <sighs> there's things I like about this unit, and there's also things that make me go, why? Why are you doing this? So, you know, we've got the signal path coming through here for the phono section and your tape section and whatnot. But you've also got these uh, auxiliary inputs, which have got these massive cable runs going all the way down to the front here and then out through a switch, and then across into this switching section, and then down to the tone section, tone control. That is a long run, and it's going straight over the top of the, the MOSFETs and whatnot. Uh, they do have some isolation here with the PCB. I don't know if that's why they did it, but this is unshielded cable as well. I don't like that. So I think in the future uh, that there is potential for that to maybe improve the quality a little bit. Maybe not, I don't know. But keep that in mind as a potential improvement possibly. But not only that, you know, you've got it coming into all this switching here and it's just, it's a mess. Like uh, noise floor is not non-existent on this unit, and I think it could have been done better, but it is what it is, you know. <laughs> you can't, can't go back in time and change this stuff. Now, the other thing that is really odd is you've got, you know, amplification stages here. Uh, I think there's two of them. Then you have the tube section <laughs> that comes out in these wires runs down to the tube section here, right? <laughs> and then it goes back to the final stage where the MOSFETs are. It's so like really weird. And I don't know why. I mean, well, I do know why. In the new version, they improved. This does... Well, improved. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, but it seems like a weird compromise just to have the tubes on display at the front. I would have preferred if the tubes were just in here where they need to be without running all this crap outside. Because, you know, these are um, high voltage, like 150 volts-ish. So that's like an antenna just running through the chassis and then back again. Not a fan, but again, it is what it is. I'm just talking about, you know, what I like and don't like. Now, the speaker switching is, well, I guess it's very 80s. It's not <laughs> what you would see these days. So instead of the signal, the, the, the output signal staying in this area and having some relays or whatever to switch it 
on or off, depending on where it needs to go. They have the audio signal running, sorry, speaker outputs running all the way to the front of the amplifier, literally on the same board as the mains wiring. That seems nuts to me. And the reason they do that is because the power switch here is right next to speaker A, speaker B switches. <laughs> so it comes all the way down, meets, you know, near your mains and whatnot, and then it runs all the way back to here again. So if there was like no, a world where I had infinite time, I would love to have like a PCB here with relays that switch the speaker outputs that are controlled from here, but not removing the actual signal front to back. Hope that makes sense anyway. Now, probably the biggest design feature I would like to see in this amplifier is a direct line in, like bypassing all the switches, everything. And that is potentially possible by either using these, this header or adding another one here, plenty of space, and routing it straight into the amplifier, uh, amplifier channels at a fixed level. Um, so that would bypass your, your noisy volume, would bypass balance, everything. Clean signal. Now, in saying that, so you, you got your, sorry, I should have actually said the signal path as well. So signal path comes in or from here, goes to the uh, tone control down here, and then you have two wires, or two bundles of wires coming out to each channel, and that's your inputs for the amplification section. These are not shielded either, which is, I, there must be a reason for it, but I can't wrap my head around how they get away with it. Yeah, so that, my sort of wish list is um, I would love to get rid of all this garbage and have remote relay switching at this end for the speaker outputs. Um, there is also the headphone output here, which is a little problematic, but I'm sure something could be worked out with a shielded cable running just for that. Interesting project for someone if they wanted to try. And also having a direct dedicated output straight into these amplification sections and I don't know, having a, a, another relay to switch or whatever. They, these are just pipe dream sort of things, but uh, yeah, pretty crazy. Okay, so you're still with me. You wanna know how this thing sounds. Well, one caveat, I don't really use speakers that often. I tend to lean towards ear speakers and headphones these days. Uh, that's not to say I don't have very big floor standards, which I do, but the outright power of this unit is excellent. It's about 65 watts-ish that I was able to bench test it at, which is fine, but I can't really do a comparison to another amplifier. And, you know, I don't believe in subjective listening. I want to do like critical AB, really fast switching, and I want to know, I want to do direct comparisons with other things without any influence or bias. So I use very sensitive headphones, 25 ohm, and my Stax ear speakers to do the actual testing. And that is the best way I've found to find out if these amplifiers are really up to, to scratch. And with sensitive loads like headphones, like 25 ohm headphones, you know, you can really pick up on noise floor. Uh, you know, any sort of issues that have snuck into the the output section versus what you're putting into the amplifier. Now, what can I say with this unit specifically? Well, the noise floor is excellent. Despite all the design weirdness with what's going on, it's not perfect. You know, past about 12 o'clock on this one, with a sensitive load, keep that in mind, you might not get the same thing if you're using hard-to-drive headphones or not super sensitive speakers but yeah beyond 12 o'clock you start to get some hiss and a bit of noise floor coming into it and that could be the volume pot 
I'm not exactly sure. When I max it out, it does seem to diminish a bit, so it could just be the pot, but I've cleaned everything. There's nothing more you can do there other than changing it all, obviously. So, yeah. Noise floor, excellent. Sound quality, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but I just want to talk about the tone section, which can be brought in or out. It's not on all the time. If you bring in the tone section, the noise floor increases significantly, and that is definitely a weakness in this unit if you use tone controls. I don't use them, so I have just sort of let this be. But if I was to guess, if you went through the tone board, changed all the resistors to metal films, because I think they're all carbon ceramics, um, you may address that issue if you want to really, really use this section. It could be the pots as well, because they are a bit, they're very hard to get right, these ones. But like I said, I don't really use that part of the amplifier so i compared this to my next flagship which is the technics suv8 it is a monster amplifier that is almost double the weight of this thing it is uh, a new class a design dual mono like it is the peak of technics integrated amplifiers and what can I say in regards to that? Well, this has superior noise floor. It is much quieter for the same given volume. But just keep in mind, this unit has about half the power of that Technics. But that's fine because I don't need the power anyway. But yeah, it is quieter. Um, the tone section is louder though. So that's an interesting sort of give and take sort of thing. But the biggest thing you want to know, does this have tube sound? <laughs> now, this tube sound is um, subjective. You know, it's described as spacious, warm, romantic, whatever. <sighs> and I'm not convinced entirely that it exists beyond a placebo effect. Because I swear I can hear it, and then there's other times I swear I can't hear it. And the only way that I know to remove my bias and my prejudice on how something should sound versus whatever is I do an AB switch blinded with the headphone outputs against the Technics. Now, it this versus a fully solid state Technics SUV8, they sound identical, except for the noise, you know, the, the noise floor and the hiss, which you can sort of mitigate with various things. But the sound signature of these amplifiers is identical. And you can take, you can spin that either way you want. You can say this sounds like a solid state, or you can say the Technics SUV8. Sounds like a tube amplifier. I don't know which way to go with that. This sounds great. I love it. But it does not sound any different to a fully solid state Technics that I have. Yeah, and that that's sort of it with it. I was convinced this thing had a tube sound, whatever. But it wasn't until I removed my bias and did a blind uh, comparison. So I was using the headphone output on both of them with a switch, jumping instantly backwards and forwards. I would even mix up the inputs so I couldn't tell which one was which, trying to critique it and find any subtle change i went down into freak you know using frequencies like 20 hertz 100 hertz to see if there's any sort of boost or whatever i couldn't find anything unfortunately i was sort of hoping this thing would have something magical about it and maybe it does but compared to my technics which is from 1980 they sound the same 
And I don't know what that means for this, but <laughs> it's um, it was a fun project anyway. And there's more to come. You know, we have its 105U Big Brother to do a full restoration on as well. And uh, I don't, maybe it's a bit of a lesson that, you know, you can't say that something sounds warm or whatever until you remove any sort of bias or control over the testing, you know. You, just because you know what you're listening to can influence how you think it sounds. So, yeah, we're done. That's the end of this one. Hope you enjoyed the video. I know it was long-winded. I wanted to make sure I just sort of covered everything off on this unit. We may do a follow-up one day. You know, try some improvements or whatever, but honestly, I don't. I think I'm just flogging a dead horse at this point. It's uh, time to just put the cover on this unit for another 20 to 40 years and just let it do what it does best, which is play music. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you in the next one.